Hello, this is Professor Ellis. I want to welcome you all again to week two of Specialized Communications for Technology Students. It's English 1133, section OL96, uh, fall 2021. So just make sure we're all in the right place. Uh, I welcome you. Now, for today's class, we need to go over a lot of things that's going to set us up for uh, tackling the first major project in the class, which is Project 1, the Job Application Portfolio. <clears throat> so I'll introduce um, the project, and then we're going to talk about the job application process and component parts. Uh, then toward the end of today's lecture, we'll talk about the weekly writing assignment and the homework that's going to be due by September 22nd. Um, if you've been following along with the syllabus and looked at the tentative schedule at the bottom, you should be aware that because of school um, holidays and, and certain days that classes are not scheduled, uh, we will not have lectures the next two weeks. Um, but I just want to let you know that even though there won't be another video lecture until September 22nd, you have work to do between now and then. That will set us up for success when we come back on September 22nd. And even though classes aren't scheduled, I still want to hold office hours and be available to you by email. So uh, every Wednesday, 3 to 5 p.m., uh, I hold office hours. Uh, you can also email me at jellis at citytech.cuny.edu. And if you can't come during my normal office hours, but you want to talk with me about the class, if you have any questions, you need something clarified, whatever it might be, that's really where our discussion can take place is whenever we meet together in office hours or over email. Then if you need an appointment, just send me an email, let me know your availability for like the next few days, and then I'll try to find a time that works best for both of us. And I'll get back to you and, and give you a link to the um, Google Hangout where I hold virtual office hours. Um, so I don't want anyone to be suffering in silence throughout the semester. Make sure that you use me as a resource. Even though we're not in person, that doesn't mean that we can't work together in different ways, whether it be asynchronously with email uh, or via our open lab site uh, or synchronously whenever we can meet together uh, over uh, video chat with office hours or by um, office hours by appointment. So take advantage of those things. Um, so we have a lot of stuff to go over, so let's go ahead and hop into it. Um, a few things, though, I want to just remind you of before we get too deep into job application stuff. Uh, make sure that, as I mentioned in our last lecture, that you are an active listener, meaning that you aren't doing other things while I'm lecturing. If you're watching this video right now, I should have your undivided attention, and you need to have your notebook out or your laptop computer or your desktop computer or whatever you're using to make notes on, and you make notes as I go over the, the topics of each um, you know, week's lecture, when I go over the assignments, because there's a lot more that I can elaborate on during a lecture than what I am going to type up for you on Open Lab. One of the reasons I do this is I want to prepare you for when you're in the workplace. Because when you're in the workplace and a manager or supervisor tells you you need to be working on X task, these are the parameters for it. It's due by this date. They're not going to give you a handout that explains all that to you. Uh, they're not going to, most anyways, won't particularly like you to come back to them and ask a lot of questions about things that they told you about the first time they told you about the task. I want to help prepare you for that eventuality when you're in your career and you're going to have these managers and supervisors that give you tasks and they expect you to follow them to the letter after maybe only hearing what it is you're supposed to be working on or doing just that one time. Um, and part of that has to do with active listening, like giving your undivided attention keeping something on hand like you know, a notepad or a notebook so that you can write things down in the moment so you don't forget or miss anything. Um, and as I mentioned in our last class, I really like the Cornell method as a way of note taking. You're dividing your paper into these three parts. You have the one line going down over to the left, dividing keywords and concepts. Those are like the main topics I talk about from the larger section on, your, on the right. Details, definitions, delineations, that's like the outline of things that I might be talking about. 
that's where you can give all those extra you know, details and characteristics and all the definitions about the terms I might talk about over on the right. And remember, after you're done taking notes during the lecture, that's not the end. At the bottom of the page, give me that, that horizontal line and write one or two sentences that summarize just what that one page of notes is about. So if you take three pages of notes on the first page, you read it over again and say, okay, this, this page is about this, and you write that down. Turn to your second page, same deal. Read over uh, from top to bottom, what is it about? Okay, I got it. Write that summary sentence or two down. And do that for all your pages because that helps you remember things better. It helps remind you where things are. And when you return to your notes, it also provides some indexing. It helps you be able to flip through very quickly and find what you're looking for without having to look through all the details, all the, the minutia that you've written down on your pages of notes. Again, this is just a recommendation. This really works well. It's, it's tested over time by lots of people. Uh, but if you've got a system that works for you, use it. And again, uh, I think taking notes by hand is better because there's a lot of research that shows that extra cognitive and muscular work of writing by hand actually helps you remember things. But if you need to take your notes like on a tablet, on a laptop, on a PC, do it. Whatever works for you as far as we're concerned in this class, do it. Uh, so that you can follow along, you'll remember what needs to get done, and you'll never miss your mark. Also, as a reminder, I think um, the majority of folks in the class have joined our Open Lab class. Uh, I will reach out individually to um, a couple of students who I've seen not get on our Open Lab um, course site yet. Uh, but just as a reminder for everyone, um, our class is here with you know, first the title English 1133 OL 96 fall 2021 and our avatar is the understanding neon sign that was at the Brooklyn waterfront a while back um, so if you see that you're in the right place and remember all the magic happens for our class when you click on visit course site over here on the right now another reminder I need to give you guys about open lab is that whenever you're turning in work or publishing some of your work on our open lab site you know, according to the directions that I give you make sure that you're always logged in you see right now you can see my name hi Jason W Ellis in the upper right hand corner so I know I'm logged in I have all these tools up here for writing posts uh, for uh, seeing comments that are awaiting moderation That's something that I see you might not uh, but both of us do have this menu here English 1133 OL 96 you can mouse over and you can see dashboard and that's something I'll show you more about how to use later on this semester um, but again I'm having you guys use open lab and specifically the open lab course site for doing your work in the class and publishing your work in the class because this gives you some experience with publishing work and doing other types of work with um, categorizing posts of using comments um, so that you can make claims as a content creator for WordPress because Open Labs course site component is built on top of WordPress. So this gives you some real world experience that you can put on a resume. Uh, so someone that may be looking at looking over the, your qualifications sees that you actually have some of these experiences, uh, whereas other candidates might not. I want to make you as uh, competitive as possible for when you're on the job market so any little thing that we can do to make that happen uh, I want to implement it as a way of achieving the goals of our class which again are those course learning outcomes I mentioned on the very first lecture that's linked at the top of our syllabus um, so again this is where all the magic happens and if you uh, come to this page but you see this where you have sign up or log in, or if I go back and I reload the page, you see sign up and log in. Well, that means I'm not logged in. So you need to click on log in. If your username and password, you can check keep me logged in if you're on your own computer. Uh, you shouldn't see this um, on when you log in. Let's see if that's correct. And then we're back uh, in action on the Open Lab site for English 1133 section OL 96 fall 2021. So make sure you're always logged in uh, because if you're not, you won't be able to 
you submit some of your work and you might get an error message. So don't let that throw you off. Just always remember, double check that you're logged in if you do get some kind of error message or uh, you don't see something, something doesn't look right. And then also a reminder about the syllabus. If you scroll down our Open Lab course site just a little bit and look over on the left, you'll see the different sections for the types of things I post to our class, like the weekly writing assignments, our lectures, and announcements for the class. But we also have at the top of the list a syllabus. I put that at the top, not alphabetically, because that's like super important. I want to make sure you always know how to get to that, um, because this is our contract for the class between you and I. Um, it has all the information about the class, about the course learning outcomes, expectations for you as students in the class, and also these really helpful links for required texts um, and then other information about uh, required resources, uh, then the projects, policies, and then finally the schedule at the bottom. So you can always refer to the schedule to find out what's going on. Now looking ahead, uh, you know, this past week, we're you know, looking back just for a second. Last week, you sent me the introductory emails. I'm still getting back to everybody about that. I have a lot of students this semester, so it is taking me longer than I hoped to, to reply to all of those emails because I do want to reply with like you know, a meaningful email, not just a hi, how's it doing? I want to like you know, be able to say something in response to what you write to me. Um, it helps me know who you are, and that's incredibly useful. Uh, when we're having an asynchronous class and we're not actually in the same place together, which you normally would make it easy for me to get to know all the students in the class very quickly. Um, so in lieu of that, we use these introductory emails. And so I'll be replying to those and then trying to remember all the different folks that are in the class. So watch for that email. Then for this week, uh, you can see uh, week two, we're going to lecture on the job application portfolio. I give you some uh, a reading on Paul Anderson, including this link here where you can read that uh, book chapter online. Uh, this was helpfully added to the Internet Archive. Uh, and if you turn over to page 22, uh, which is actually page 50 of the books, so there's a lot of you know, other text in the beginning of the book. Uh, but this chapter two, overview of the reading centered communication process, obtaining a job, Paul Anderson gives a lot of really useful information uh, about the different documents that go into the job search. Um, so I want you to read that before our next uh, class on September 22nd. So a lot of time to do that. Don't falter. You need to be doing this kind of work in order to be successful with the types of documents you're going to be creating for project one and then using when you go out on the job market because even if you have a job now or you're you already have an internship or you have some of these documents i want you to start with them with like a fresh look uh, so we can develop them in particular ways which i'll discuss with you uh, but also so that you don't uh, necessarily get in a rut with these documents um, a lot of folks you know, are you know, given the idea from a variety of sources that these documents are very cookie cutter. There's a lot of templates for them. Um, but what we need to be doing is customizing these documents, particu particularly for those top tier jobs you want, uh, in order to be able to convey to whoever might be hiring you or considering hiring you that you deserve an interview, which then you have the interview for the job. And that ultimately is going to decide whether you get the position or not. But we want the documents you use, your resume, your job application letter, and the research you do before writing those documents to send in um, are as strong as possible. Um, because any little thing can disqualify you, and obviously you're up against a lot of other well-qualified people from a lot of different colleges. Uh, if you're, even if you're not staying in this area, even if you have mobility to move into other uh, cities, other parts of the country, there's still a lot of competition for these jobs. Uh, so you really need to be able to demonstrate that you are the strongest possible candidate and that you deserve that interview. So we'll be talking about that, but read this chapter before September 22nd uh, so that you get some more background on the job application process and the, what needs to go into the different documents that we're going to be making together. All right, so we've got that. Um, 
Also, uh, just to give you a heads up, and I'll remind you about this at the end of today's uh, class, in end of today's lecture, is there's no, no classes scheduled September 3rd through 8th or September 15th through 16th. And that's all on the academic calendar from the college, which I gave you a link to. So there won't be any video lectures the next two weeks, but I don't want you to think that you're just left high and dry. I'm going to hold office hours each week on Wednesdays, three to five, even though there's no classes scheduled. I will be here and I'll be available if you have questions about anything relating to the class or anything related to school. You can also email me. Remember my email address is jellis at citytech.cuny.edu. And if you need to make an appointment for office hours outside of the Wednesday time, let me know what your availability is for a few days and I'll get back to you with a time that matches my schedule. We may have more back and forth, but we will try to figure out a time to accommodate you for those office hours. All right, and we'll talk about um, weekly writing and homework uh, toward the end of today's class. All right, so let's talk about the job application process. Now, um, these lecture slides that I'm going to be working from uh, I actually developed for an open lab site that I'll give you a link to because it has a lot more information and it has some useful documents that we'll be using later on uh, called Job Search Advice. So this is a site that I made for all City Tech students a while back and it includes uh, a video lecture where I go into a lot more depth on the job search um, components and so I would recommend this video as well as a resource for you to use to learn more about the different documents that we're going to talk about in our class. Um, but you know, in both, if you listen to both, obviously you get more. Um, but at bare minimum, you want to listen to today's lecture, be making notes on it. And if you have time, take a look at this other video um, because it is incredibly useful. And then below that, you'll see that I've included sample documents that we're going to be using in the classes ahead. Uh, sample resume skills, a blank version, a sample experience uh, resume, a blank version, and then a sample job application letter. And then I've included links for things uh, that can be useful for looking for jobs, doing research on the businesses you might be applying for, uh, more information about resumes, cover letters, how to prepare for interviews. Um, these sites here for general job hunting advice, uh, writing resources to make your documents really sing, like looking at a thesaurus, making sure you're using the right uh, verbs, um, you're trying to you're pepper in some adjectives and adverbs where useful, not overly so, um, how to improve the drafts of the different documents, uh, etc. All of this, um, all these links here can be useful to you uh, as you prepare for the job market, and which is a big part of this section of our class. So let's talk about the application process. So first off, you want to do some preparation. Uh, you want to be reading, studying, and taking notes of job listings on sites like LinkedIn.com, Monster.com, Indeed.com, Glassdoor.com, and also the New York Times has a job section which we'll take a look at later uh, as a part of this week's uh, weekly writing assignment. Um, these sites you know, all offer different ways both to look for jobs well, as well as to create a profile so that it helps you in the job application process. Now as a part of Project 1, uh, which we should go back and take a look at real quick, you will be creating a LinkedIn.com profile. Uh, so before we get too deep in this, let's go back over to the syllabus and look at the grade distribution so we can look at project one. So project one, job application portfolio, 25% of your grade. Um, by, the thing is, is like you, you do good work, you put in the effort, you create solid documents, uh, you make sure that they're bulletproof, no like you know, uh, typos and misspellings, everything looks really polished, you're gonna be really happy with the grade that you get on these documents. If they're sloppy, you're not putting in the effort, uh, it shows that you, I, you, for whatever reason, maybe you don't want a job, you're probably not going to be as happy with your grade on this part of the project. This is a huge chunk of your grade, 
Uh, but it's also the easiest, I think, to get because you ought to be motivated to create really good documents for the job search. So what are you, what kind of documents are you making? You're gonna create a portfolio, meaning a collection of documents, um, that includes a letter of application for specific jobs. So you're gonna be looking through some of those uh, sites I mentioned for a job and using that as the basis for the letter of application that you write. That's basically a one-page letter, single-spaced, in which you make an argument that you are the best candidate for that job and that you deserve an interview. Because you know, one of the things that we'll talk about is that these documents aren't what get you the job. These documents get your foot in the door to get an interview. And then it's that, um, basically that performance that you give during your interview is going to determine whether you get that job or not. Uh, so we're just trying to get you that interview. So you'll create that letter you're also going to make two different types of resumes. Um, the first is a skills-based resume, which is really great for students that are just coming out of a program, just graduating, because it really highlights what you know how to do when you might not have a lot of work experience in that field yet. I mean, you might have a lot of work experience, but what we're like aiming for is being able to show what you can do for this career that you're getting into, not just the fact that you've had some jobs. Then the second type of resume we're going to make is the more traditional chronological work experience type resume. And that's going to focus on your education and your work experience and what you gain from those different jobs that's prepared you for this job you're now applying for. Um, you might already have some you know, great work experience that applies or we're going to, if you don't, we're going to think about what work experience, volunteer experience, community ex you know, um, support experience that you have that you might be able to leverage uh, as a way to uh, show certain skills that will be beneficial uh, in the job that you're applying for. And then finally, you'll also create a LinkedIn.com profile. Uh, by and large today, LinkedIn.com is where I'll, you know, I don't know any numbers, but I don't know of anybody that's on the job market now that doesn't have a LinkedIn.com profile. It, I think it's absolutely imperative that you have a profile, that you have a presence there, that you're updating it, keeping it up to date with your work experience, other skills that you have, uh, but it's professional. It's something that you need to keep distinct in your mind in the way that you use it uh, as a social media platform that's focused on work, that's focused on professionalism, and shouldn't be confused in any way with the way that you might use, like, say, Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, etc. LinkedIn.com is some place where you can present your professional self. Um, and we'll talk about, like, that relationship between your work self, your professional self, and then your private self, uh, which in today's world, um, those lines uh, blur. Uh, and we have to be very careful with the way that we use internet technologies uh, to present and create uh, a sense of self for others online because it can be something that comes back um, and bites you on the rear end and we don't want that to happen. So again, returning to the job application process and how it relates to project one. So when you're preparing for the job search, you want to Find out everything you can about the job market uh, using these sites, not just simply to look for jobs, but look for patterns, look for keywords, learn the specialized jargon that you see in the job ads so that you can think about like, do you, are you already qualified for those things or does it point towards something that you can learn on your own maybe or that maybe with extra training you can acquire uh, so that you are then qualified for jobs that you want. Um, this is where you use these job search sites as a research tool. Um, also, incorporate appropriate and accurate language that's used in job listings into your job search materials. So if, the, if you see like 20 jobs that are listed on these sites using a specific phrase or certain terminology to, to describe something that you know how to do, but your resume or your job letter doesn't use that same phrase, 
Well, bingo, this is something that you need to look at and think, well, maybe I need to start using that same phrase because obviously it's something they're looking for. And the kind of thing to, to, to keep in mind is the people that are looking at your job application materials might not be the, the people that are trained the same way as you. They could be someone in human resources. They could be a manager that is in charge of you know, hiring a certain number of people, but you know, it may be beyond their you know, expertise. And so you want to present yourself in a way that, as you can see here, that is honest and obviously ethical, like you don't want to lie about anything. But if there's a certain way you need to frame or talk about what you know how to do that matches the way that it is on these job ads, then you need to do that in order to make yourself more visible and you more um, you, that you're essentially demonstrating that you can do those things to someone who may be a non-specialist. Um, so there's a lot we can learn from these job ads, and that's something that also changes over time. So even though you you get on the job market now and you get a good job and uh, you don't even thinking about looking for a job for the next few years because you love your job, you shouldn't be doing that. Throughout your career, you should be spending time going back to job search engines, learning about what different uh, companies are looking for. Because like, besides like keeping your documents up to date by incorporating the most current language that's being used, it can also alert you to trends that you might not be aware of or that you may not really be thinking about in terms of how to reskill or how to you know, supplement the education and skill set you already have to be prepared for like maybe a new opportunity or in the case of like you know if you get laid off that you're not like having to catch up you're already ahead of the game by doing that research and doing the work that's required to bring yourself up to whatever level it is that you want that matches the new jobs that are being offered. So job search uh, is an incredibly good way to, to learn not only how to keep your documents up to date, but also to know how to be prepared for you know, uh, eventualities in your own career. So learning about companies. So when you're looking at the job ads, you know, obviously it's gonna say who it is that's doing the hiring. They'll usually have some blurb about the company and it may be a company you've never heard of before. It, it may even be a company that you have heard about before. But regardless, you need to do some background research on them. Simply using Google, looking on social media, you can do searches on the New York Times for that company's name and again, you need to you sign up for your free New York Times subscription because we're going to be using that uh, as part of the this week's weekly writing assignment. Just go to nytimes.com slash passes, use your City Tech email address to sign up, and you'll be able to get that one year free subscription. And you can renew that every year while you're still a student, while you have access to your City Tech email, and even after um, you graduate, I, you theoretically. Also, another important resource you need to use is our library. If you go to library.citytech.cuny.edu and then go to Find Articles uh, over on the left-hand side after you scroll down the page, look in uh, the business section and use those databases there. And what you can find is by plugging in the company's name, You'll find articles that talk about the company, how many employees they have, where they're located at, um, and you might also find news articles about them. And that's really important because if it's a company you've never heard of before, it's good to find out if like there's ever been any scandals or anything that may look bad on the company because you have to also decide, besides the fact that you obviously need a job, about whether that's the place you really want to try to get a job that you want to put in the time to try to work there. Because if it sounds like it's a really terrible place to work, I, you know, personally, I wouldn't want to apply there. I mean, whenever I was looking for jobs before I got this one at City Tech, there were places that I saw were hiring you know, professors to teach these same classes I teach at City Tech. But by doing this next thing, use your network and ask around, I would find out from people like there were certain schools that were described as like viper nests, like you know, the people that worked there were like mean and nasty and uh, backstabbing. And I just simply didn't apply to those jobs. I didn't even want to waste my time because if by 
you know, listening to people that I trust about those places, it told me that that was just simply not the right place for me to work, even if you know, it came down to the wire that I had to get a job somewhere. Uh, because there, there are always lots of opportunities. We just have to keep you know, digging and hunting and, and you know, hustling for them. Um, but if you find out about a place that just doesn't sound like the right place for you, um, don't. I, I recommend you don't apply there because you don't want to land a job and then suddenly be miserable. And maybe you end up quitting, which then puts you back on the job market. And then when you apply for that next job, there's going to be questions during the interview about why you left that company. And then it's going to be you know, on you about you know, what you say and also the fact that you're probably not going to be able to use that company and whoever your manager was as a, as a recommendation. So, I mean, all these things need to figure into your mind when you're thinking about where to be applying for jobs. Now, Part of this week's homework is going to involve this, that the part before you actually write your resume. And what I recommend is that you create a document, you know, whatever word processor you like, that you can save or, you know, on your computer or in the cloud. And you want to put into this document all the relevant job search information about yourself. So all of your education information, like you know, where you went to high school, when you graduated, what was your graduation GPA? Did you get any special like seals on your diploma? Did you get any kind of accolades where you're like in National Honor Society or any of that kind of stuff? List all that down. Doesn't have to be pretty. Just put it like in different sections, like a section for education, um, a section for like your work experience, section for volunteer experience, uh, and then create a section where you list like. Uh, all of your skills, everything that you know how to do, and nothing is too unimportant, nothing is too small, and it doesn't always have to be things that are totally specific on the job that you want, because you're depending on what it is, you might find ways to leverage some of those skills um, for a particular job offered by a specific company um, when you apply for that position. So basically, this document is your database for all of that you're going to draw from for all the different documents that you make for your different types of resumes and your job application letter. So the more information about yourself that you can type into this document, the better off you're going to be. Because it's better to have way too much information than too little because you can pull, copy and paste what you need into these resumes and into that job application letter that we're going to be making. So part of your homework this week, and I'll, I'll remind you about this at, at the end of today's class, give you some parameters for it, is going to be creating this document and putting all this information in. If, for example, you already have a resume, just copy and paste some of that stuff into this document and then add more to it. And you really need to sit down and think about it for a while. Don't just like you spend like five minutes like say, okay, I'm done. Well, if you just spend five minutes on it and that's all, well, good luck getting a job because if you're only spending five minutes on it, you're not investing the time and energy necessary to be landing those top tier jobs that I hope that you would actually want to achieve. You need to be putting in the time in this as if it were your job. And that, that's what's key to like whether you're successful or less successful on the job market. The more energy, the more time, the more thought, the more research that you can put into it, the more care and craft that you put into your documents, the better off you're going to be whenever you are you're sending the, the, the documents out and hoping to hear back about uh, an interview. Now in the long term, what you want to be doing is updating this document with anything else that comes up as you get more education, as you get new certifications, as you gain new skills, uh, more job experiences. Uh, make sure you include all the details in this document. You should write down, like for jobs, uh, your former managers. You need to include dates when you work there. Uh, include every type of responsibility that you had at these jobs. Uh, everything from handling money to data entry, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Put it down. Um, if there are phone numbers, addresses, any of that kind of stuff for these jobs, put that down as well. 
because you don't know like when you go to apply for a job they may also have an online application and they may ask you for some of that specific information uh, like an address or a manager's phone number that kind of thing if you have it all already in this document you can just pull up this document when you go to these places to apply for these jobs so again this document can serve um, a lot of purposes and save you a lot of headache so that you're not like you know all suited up going out for like you know, um, putting out applications or going to interviews and you pull up short because you don't have some of this information that the potential employers asking you of so put that information in this document so that you can draw on it whenever it's needed whether it be when you're creating the documents or when you're actually out in the field um, going to interviews or dropping off documents. Um, here's a list of, of, of different types of things that you can put into this document. Uh, your education history, the degrees that you've gotten. You, speci you say specifically what kind of degree you have, even from high school. Look on the, on the diploma and see what it says it is. Uh, list your schools, your GPA, the dates that you attended uh, that school. Uh, same is true for City Tech, or if you transferred somewhere before you came to City Tech. Include all that. Uh, also think about with college, you need to be focused not just on your overall GPA, but also your major GPA. Uh, because you know, for some students, your major GPA may be like 4.0, but your general GPA may be like a 3. So you want to list both of those things uh, on your documents, or even in some cases you might only list your major GPA as long as you specify that's what it is. Uh, unless, of course, the, the company asks for both or one or the other. Because, um, again, you have to be ethical. You have to be honest with the information you present. But you, there are certainly um, ways that we can be strategic in the way that we foreground certain information uh, to try to make you look as positive and as good as possible uh, for these um, jobs that you're applying for. Uh, include all your work experience. Make sure you learn your job titles that you have, the specific job titles, um, the locations, responsibilities, the dates you worked at different places, like your start date, your end date. And with these, it's not necessary to know like the day, like the the, the day of the month, but you should know the month and the year. Okay. Um, any leadership opportunities that you've had, if you've been in Boy Scouts or Explorers, um, Girl Scouts, any of these types of things, or even in like a church, a volunteer group, um, any of those types of things. And when I say leadership, it doesn't mean just necessarily like someone who's like the top leader, but if you've had certain leadership responsibilities in a large way, a medium way, a small way, any of that stuff, list it. Um, if you've done any special projects, um, not only in, in the workplace, but also uh, in your classes or as a part of a fellowship or a grant uh, with the school, uh, any skills, abilities, certifications that you've received. And again, it doesn't matter. Um, I mean, if you've put your own PC together, include that and list what kind of PC it was. Was it, some, was it Intel or AMD based? Uh, when did you build it? What operating system did you install? Um, did you upgrade it over time? Any of that kind of information might potentially be useful, so put it down. Um, very important, do you have any communication skills beyond um, just like you know the fact like you know how to work well with others? You need to give specifics of when you've worked with others uh, in a communication capacity. Uh, maybe you were a point person on a project or a leader on a project or perhaps you were in charge of the shift at your workplace uh, and you had to make schedules and communicate those schedules to your staff or you had to work customer service and so you're talking to your customers or clients. Uh, were you responsible for writing emails or text messages or uh, using the social media account for the company? Any of these kinds of things that, where you were doing different types of communication, list them down. And then most importantly, make sure you reserve a section for references. Uh, this should include names, uh, a work or a professional title for the person, a phone number, an email address, uh, a mailing address if you can get it. Um, and this can be anybody that you can serve as a reference for different purposes. 
especially for folks that are graduating, you want to you know, talk to uh, some of your former or current professors and ask them if they can be a strong reference for you. That's a very key phrase to use, a strong reference, because there's a difference between being a reference and being a strong reference. A strong reference is someone who can really speak to your abilities, what you're capable of doing, that they think you are you know, a strong candidate for a job, they may think you're a great individual, but someone who just simply serves as a reference may just be able to speak to the fact that you passed the class, um, they may not have any special things to say about you, so you want to ask your professors if they can be a strong reference for you. And you need to be prepared that you know, some will say they can't. And because they're only being honest, because whenever you know, someone calls on us about a student for a job, we have, you know, we're ethically bound to be honest. We're not going to lie and say you're the greatest person ever with all the best skills in the world, like you know, uh, you know, an Einstein combined with an Elon Musk, right? We're going to say exactly you know, what we think you're capable of and what we observe in terms of your behavior and in, in the skills that you demonstrate through the work you did in our classes or on our projects. So the more that you can foster in terms of doing good work in classes, you know, getting to know your professors, that increases the chance you're going to be able to get that strong reference from some of those. The same is true for you know, your uh, work managers. Um, you can also get uh, personal references like you know, from a pastor or reverend, um, a priest, um, maybe people that uh, are in charge of maybe volunteer work that you've been involved in. Um, anyone that essentially isn't you know, directly related to you uh, can serve as a professional reference in some capacity. Uh, but the more that you can list there that you've spoken with, that you know that can give you that, that strong reference, the better because as you apply for jobs, there's some jobs where you may say, well, I want to list you know, my former manager at this job for as my main reference here but for this other job I think it would be better if I get this other person that I worked with as my reference or maybe a former professor you can pick and choose who you're going to be giving as your references now right now you may not have many and that's okay okay I don't want to like give the wrong signal here that's something you build over time but certainly the more that you can that you can list that you people that you've spoken with um, the better. Now let's talk a little bit about resume basics. So at this point in your careers, uh, just graduating you know, from City Tech, uh, the resume should be one page maximum. Okay, Don't go beyond one page. One, it, it can look bad in a lot of different ways. Uh, because one, it shows that you're not able to show what you're capable of doing in a concise way for the specific, specifics of the job you're applying for. Um, also, it you know, isn't professional looking on yourself because there is a certain culture around the job application process. And that culture calls for a one page maximum for people that are beginning their careers. Now, over time, as you gain more experience, more certifications, etc., your resume can grow. But for right now, it should not be one, more than one page. Um, now, you should avoid fancy templates that come like with Microsoft Word that have like a lot of swirly patterns and pretty colors and background uh, images. That's all bullshit. Do not use those. Um, the main reason that you should build your own resume from scratch um, using you know the, the the page layout features of whatever word processor you use is you want to make it easily readable where you use a single font type that you use size and bold to distinguish headings and titles so that it makes the resume very easily readable not just for a human being but more importantly for a computer because more and more jobs you apply for, you're going to be submitting either an electronic resume, and even for those jobs you, you submit a printed copy of your resume, those companies will take your paper resume, stack it up with a whole bunch of other resumes they got, and then they're going to stick it into a, a feeding scanner machine, 
that scans each of those one-page resumes and puts it in a database where their hiring managers can search through the text that has been detected with OCR software um, and your original resume is essentially forgotten. They have all the data from it and they can search it now. So you want to make it machine readable. If you have all that fancy swirly weird stuff that like is very popular like with Microsoft Word, you're going to make it more difficult for the computer to read it accurately and it's going to put a bunch of garbage into your database entry for their um, job search. And that ultimately is going to mean you don't get hired because they're going to think that you have a weird name, that you're from Mars, and that uh, in your spare time instead of like, you know, uh, saying that you build computers that, I don't know, you, you play with Play-Doh. I mean, the idea is that you don't want anything to screw up the accuracy of that information that you're giving them about yourself so that it reflects poorly on you or just turns into garbage and nonsense. Now, as a part of your resume, you should have a strong go-to resume. This will be like a, a basic version that speaks to your best qualities in general. But then you're gonna customize that resume for those top 10 type jobs, those jobs that you want more than anything else in the world. And that's where you give a lot more thought and you apply more research uh, as, you're, as you modify that go-to resume for those specific jobs. Now there's two types of resumes and these are the types we're gonna be building in our class. There's the skills-focused resume, and again, this is good for entry-level positions and people just starting off in their careers, but it emphasizes what you know and what you can do, all right? So at the very top, really, you're, you got sections for different types of skills, and then you give details next to each of those about you know, what you can do in those different topic headings. But then we're also going to use uh, your database of all your work and education experiences to create an experience-focused resume. This is the traditional reverse chronological resume where at the top it shows your most recent job and at the bottom your least recent job has a section for your education. But it really emphasizes work experience over the experience and skills that you have. Of course, there's places we can add those, but it's what is foregrounded is what determines the type of resume that we're talking about. So the general resume parts, and again, as we're going through this, you ought to be putting these things into your notes. You need to be actively listening. So these are the main parts that you need to be listing in your notes. So you start off with your name and your contact information. While you're a student at City Tech, and even afterwards, you should always use your City Tech email address because you know as an alumni, you're able, you still have your email address at City Tech. Again, that's a way to prove that you went to school there. Um, whereas if you're using, you know, like Gmail, anybody can make a Gmail account, uh, or using something like Hotmail or Yahoo.com, there are a lot of biases about what it means to have those particular email addresses. You don't want to do that. Uh, you want to present yourself in the most professional light. Uh, so use the City Tech email address as your professional contact. Now you can set it up so that your City Tech email address forwards to another email address. Um, but again, that is a way to signal that you are really or really were a student at City Tech. Um, at the top of your resume, after that, you should have an objective. That would be one sentence that describes you know, what kind of job you want, if you're applying for a specific job, it should include that job title in it. Um, and it should also include um, the type of company that you want to work for. And that should be tailored to the type of company you're applying to. So you wouldn't want to say that you want to get like a job uh, as a, you say a technical writer at a large enterprise corporation if you're applying for a small business that employs only a handful of technical writers you would want to modify that objective statement so that it reflects the type of position you're applying for. Uh, because if there's that mismatch, that's going to raise questions in the mind of whoever's looking at your resume about whether they should give you an interview or not. Uh, you should have a section on education. Um, 
unless your high school education is relevant to the job you're applying for, like let's say you got a special seal on your diploma or took special classes that are related to the job you're applying for or show how you got prepared for college in your major, don't include high school. You want to just include college once you've graduated or when you're close to graduation from City Tech. You might include a section on relevant coursework that you've taken that shows from the titles of the classes um, that how you've prepared for whatever job you're applying for. And now, for that relevant coursework, you want to include the name of the class first, and then maybe in parentheses the code for the class. So, like for example, if you're taking um, Introduction to Language and Technology, you start with that on that that particular point and in the parentheses after it you can say ENG 1710. You don't want to start with English 1710 because whoever you're, is looking at your resume may not know what the hell that means. Um, a section for work experience, again a reverse chronological order, meaning the newest job at the top, oldest job at the bottom. Uh, a section for relevant skills. These should be skills that are relevant to the job you're applying for. So if you're applying for a job in technical writing, you don't want to include that you have a skill for like axe throwing. That just is all kinds of wrong in that because they're going to wonder like, are you psycho? Are you going to bring axes to work? All this. So only list things that are relevant skills for the job you're applying for. Um, also include a section for awards, honors, any special qualifications you might have. Part of that could include like uh, your language skills. You should always list what languages you know if you're multilingual. Uh, also include next to that your proficiency. Like you can say like you're fluent, uh, you're a native speaker, native writer, uh, or if you have like a business capacity for uh, the language etc. So give some sort of qualification for how good you are for those other languages you might know. And then at the very bottom you should include your references. The maximum number should be three references at the bottom. Now the reason why I say you should put references on your resume is a lot of folks say you, that you shouldn't include that on there. So some people like to put a little sentence that looks kind of dumb to me. It says references available on request. Well do you think it's better to go ahead and give your potential employer references so they can call them as soon as they think you're the right candidate or do you want to waste their time to have to contact you say we are interested can you send us your references and then they have to wait on you to then reply with your references obviously it's better to give them that information up front so that they can begin calling those references and get you in for an interview as soon as possible because if you're being considered more quickly, that puts you on the fast track. That's the fast lane. We want that for you. So don't make them do extra work to try to get you in the door for an interview. Go ahead and give them that if you can fit it on your one-page resume. Um, so you can see here, a based on the template that, that I provided over on the Job Search Advice site, a basic skills-focused resume. Uh, you can see that I give contact information at the top, the name, address, um, email address, a cell phone number, have objective to plan, create, and manage technical writing needs within a team at an enterprise IT firm. Uh, skills and accomplishments, you can see I created these subcategories, a section for management skills, a section for innovation, a section for design and layout skills, and a section for technical expertise. Uh, I give some employment history underneath that. Uh, underneath that, education, again, only focused on um, college. Uh, professional societies, like if you're a technical writing major, you need to join the Society for Technical Communication sooner rather than later. That's a great way to get your know, extra skills by going to their meetings. Uh, they have lots of webinars. They also have networking to help you to help put you in contact with places that are hiring. Uh, special qualifications and honors. So I include like languages, uh, working on computers. Uh, you know, I was an Eagle Scout, so I included that on this you know, mock-up sample um, resume. Anything like that that makes you stand out 
um, in a positive light, put that on there. Uh, and then references. So I have you know, three references here with name, address, phone number, and email address. Uh, and again, these are people that you know, serve different purposes, like a professor, someone who was a team leader at a former job, and then also someone who is a pastor. Uh, again, as you gain more experience, you're going to get more people that you can ask to serve as a reference. Um, but if you don't have a lot of references, seek out those people who do know you well uh, that aren't related to you that can speak to uh, your abilities or your characteristics, um, the type of person you are, etc. Now here I've given an example of an experience-focused resume. And again, you can download all these from the uh, Job Search Advice site. Um, to look at them more closely. But you can see here again, objective. Um, because I'm talking about experience, I lead off with education. I talk about the specialized courses that I took in that major. Uh, I talk about a, a project for a real client, meaning someone who, you know, a project that wasn't like a class um, thing that I did. Uh, work history, here's where we give the rever reverse chronological list of jobs, the dates, and then what specific uh, task uh, that the person had in those jobs. Again, try to fit in some special qualifications and honors like leadership position, um, awards, and then again references at the very bottom. Three references if you can fit them in. Now, in addition to the resume, you also need to have a job application letter. Like the resume, you can have a, a go-to application letter, or what other uh, some folks call a cover letter, but you should always customize it for the job you're applying for. Make sure that you change the name of the company. Uh, if you can get the name of the hiring manager or whoever it made the job listing on whatever website you're looking at uh, for the job listing, put that on there. And also, obviously, update the date that, you, that you're writing it and sending it. Um, and always double check for typos. Read your letter aloud. Take the time to see if there are any mistakes, awkward sentences, because for some places you apply, even like a typo can disqualify you for a job. Because you have to imagine a, a place hiring for um, a, a professional position might get 100 resumes. Well, whoever's doing that first weeding out of candidates is going to look for the easiest way to eliminate some of those potential hires. And typos, misspellings, um, sloppy uh, documents, etc., are surefire ways to get your resume in the trash can and your job application letter in, in the trash can. So you got to make sure they are bulletproof, no mistakes. Now the letter itself is making an argument, all right? It's just like you know, uh, an argumentative paper that you would have written in English 1101 or English 1121. Um, you're making the argument you are qualified, that you add value to the company, and that you deserve an interview, and you say why. Now what you don't want to make an argument about in these types of letters is you don't want to say like how working there is going to help you out and is going to give you lots of really great experiences or any of that kind of stuff. The company doesn't care what they can do for you. What they care about is what you can do for the company. And so as far as your job application letter is concerned, you want to be making that argument about how you're going to add a whole lot of value to their company by all the things that you can do, the energy that you bring, the skills that you bring, etc. Now, as a part of that argument, you just can't say that you can do all this stuff. You need to provide some evidence. You add details. Tell, tell a brief story that's relevant to why you would be a good candidate. You can give an anecdote, um, et cetera, about relevant details that are on the resume. So on the resume, you don't have a lot of room to expand on things. Uh, but like, for example, on that experience-based resume that I just showed you, I listed that, uh, that the candidate was an Eagle Scout. Well, in the job application letter, you could write a little paragraph, like if you have a similar qualification, about how you serving as the leader 
for your project to get Eagle Scout, like how you had to um, get donations, how you had to organize a work schedule, how you had to um, coordinate amongst different uh, skill, uh, skilled people that provided their, their labor to the project. All these types of things demonstrate that you're a good leader and you might be, like say, applying for some sort of management position or supervisory position. Well, that kind of story shows you have some kind of experience with that. Uh, it's not necessarily saying it's like the best experience in the world, but it's something concrete and solid you can point to. And then when you, if they call you for an interview, then you can elaborate on that if they ask you about it. But think of the letter as being that space where you get to say more about what's on the resume that's very bare bones and just going on very specific details. The resume and the job application, the cover letter, work together. Okay, they shouldn't be separate things. They work together. Now, the main parts of your job application letter, they are going to include your address and the date. You want to give a name, title, and address of addressee, like who you're sending it to if possible. You begin with the salutation. Dear so-and-so, greeting so-and-so. Hope, you're, hope this letter finds you doing well. I hope that you are well and healthy, um, etc. You want to state at the very beginning the position that you're applying for and provide your thesis statement. This is your, again, it's an argument. You want to say, uh, I'm writing this letter to apply for this job. I believe I'm the right candidate because, and you give some reasons. And then in the rest of the body of the letter, you want to elaborate on those reasons from your thesis statement. It's just like writing an argument essay from English 1101 and 1121, but you're writing about yourself. You're making the argument you are the right person for this job and you deserve that interview. Um, your concluding paragraph should say something like, you know, um, I, of course I look forward to interviewing with you uh, at your convenience or um, I hope to hear from you soon about an interview. I look forward to talking with you. And then you want to include your contact details again that are on your resume, uh, your phone number and email address. Again, it's just helping them out, know where this information is, not making it so they have to hunt for it from different documents. Give it to them a couple of times in different places. It helps them out. And then you have a closing, you sincerely, uh, comma and then you give your signature and then underneath your signature you want to type out your name uh, don't you, that way it helps a person know who you are because obviously our signatures are, are, can be difficult to read and then at the very bottom also note that there's an enclosure that is your, which should be your resume and anything else they may be asking for so here I've given uh, a sample job application letter I, as I mentioned you, you have your uh, address and the date that you're sending it at the top. You have the ad, the name, title, uh, job title, and address of who you're sending the letter to. I mean, this is, is, is the same as if you're sending this letter electronically. You still need to include this, this old stuff with like a mailing address. And also, I didn't mention the job application letter also should only be one page, single spaced. Okay, no more. Now you can play with the margins on these documents. Uh, I recommend a half inch all the way around. The same is true on the resume. Um, and also on the resume, I didn't mention before, but you'll see it when you look at the, the sample documents, you can put text in the header of the document that's separate from the main writing area of, the doc, of your, your word processing document. Um, your dear Mr. Uh, Gayeski, you know, the name of the person I'm writing this to, I'm applying for the position of technical support engineer slash help desk manager advertised on monster.com. So I say the title, say where I found the job listing. I believe that my work experience, educational background, and commitment to helping others use computer technology would make me a valuable contributor to the work that you do at Somerset Technology Group. So again, those three parts of my thesis statement, work experience, educational background, and commitment to helping others, those correspond to these three paragraphs in the body of my letter. One, your work experience is first. Educational background, second. Commitment to helping others is third. 
you, you can put whatever you want in there for your thesis statement. But again, you want to have that logical connection, just like our pre, in your previous lecture, thinking about rhetorical appeals. Your thesis needs to have a certain kind of logic to it, you know, in, in that the letter follows the logic of your thesis statement, the logos. Then uh, you see at the bottom, I include my contact information again, sincerely, comma, give a signature. I type my name underneath, and then at the bottom, enclosure, colon, space, resume. Now, with your, in addition to these documents, it's absolutely important to have a professional online presence. And this is where, for this project, you're going to be creating a LinkedIn.com account. But you can also create accounts on Monster.com, Indeed.com, and Glassdoor.com. Um, all of them ask for different kinds of information, but again, each of those can be a signpost that lead back to your main professional online presence, which I would recommend being LinkedIn.com, which what's great about it is you can create your profile so that um, it has a link, a unique link to your LinkedIn.com profile, which you can then add to these other sites. So if, like say, a recruiter is looking for professionals on like Monster.com, you've included that link in your profile, all they gotta do is click the link and they go right over. So again, you can link your, your presence online together by using that LinkedIn.com profile. Um, also, I'd recommend create a portfolio of examples of your work that you can link to. And like with LinkedIn.com, you can link to that portfolio. You can create one on your own website. You can create your buy a domain name and host it like on WordPress.com or DreamHost.com or someplace like that. Or you can create an e-portfolio for free on OpenLab. And you can pull documents that you've made on classes that you've taken with OpenLab into that. And you can also create new posts uh, for classes that weren't on OpenLab. So it's a place that you can showcase your work, what you're capable of, and then you provide that link and that you know, a recruiter or you know, someone that you're applying for a job can just click that link from your LinkedIn.com profile and learn more about what you're capable of doing. Now, highly recommend that, you've, that you begin working on this if you haven't already. You need to scrub the internet of you know, any past accounts that you don't use or that look uh, unfavorably on you, old posts, messages, images, anything at all that can be traced back to you uh, because one of the things with you know how interconnected things are online now it's relatively easy for folks to define things that you may think are forgotten or that are buried that you know, things live forever online and so if at all possible you know, go back into old accounts or recover passwords reset passwords on sites you haven't visited like in five years ten years uh, and shut that stuff down. You need to cancel those accounts, close them, delete posts, anything at all, especially like usernames um, or posts that you might have uh, made in the past. Get rid of anything that looks not good on you, uh, because you know one of the things. And again, like you know, related to this is like the need for you to professionalize your social media and lock down personal accounts with the understanding that nothing online is private, okay? Someone, somewhere, somehow can always access anything that we might put online. The only surefire way is that it doesn't go online in the first place. So lock down what you can, but anything that you can professionalize or make look as professional as possible, you should do. Because one of the things to keep in mind um, is certainly I understand like you know, uh, the First Amendment and our right to free speech, uh, our right to our right to privacy. But the thing about the Constitution is that it protects us from our government. It doesn't protect us in a sense, you know, from companies or outrage that could be directed at things that we've done in our past after we've been employed somewhere that then reflects poorly on the company we work for. And because you know, in most places uh, we work uh, on an um, uh, at higher basis, so I mean we can be let go at any point in time uh, for any reason. So you don't want anything at all that could negatively reflect on you or you as a representative of a company 
because those things will get you fired and it can make it incredibly hard for you to find a new job in your career uh, once it's already been recognized that you, you know, this outrage has been created about you uh, for something you've done in the past. So scrub those things and, and don't do anything or post things that are going to uh, look potentially negative about you. Um, and this, this relates to everything about you know, any opinions you might have about things in the news, uh, things that you may even say in jest, uh, or even in, you know, for satirical purposes or for humor. Um, the bottom line is, you put it online, it, it could wind up you know, uh, in a very bad way for you. So make sure that whatever you do online is as professional as possible. Everything from your usernames to what pictures you post, what you say, etc. Um, so that you have the best chances of not you know, having something that's online um, reflect poorly on you and cause you to potentially lose your job, uh, get in trouble in the workplace, etc. But for everything that is positive that you do keep, you should create links and connections between them. Um, that, can, that can strengthen your online presence, not only in terms of what shows up like in a Google search for your name, um, but also in the way that you're presenting yourself through your, uh, your LinkedIn.com profile that's connected to your ePortfolio site, that's connected to all these other places that you're presenting yourself professionally. Now, after you've done all this stuff to get an interview, you're going to get the call back for the interview. Um, and there's lots of interview questions that you can find online, lists of them. And I give you some links for li a list of inter uh, interview questions on the Job Advice um, Open Lab site. You should definitely review those questions. And not just like read them once and don't think about it, but you need to read a question, put it down, think about responses so you can practice them. Uh, you want to practice saying your answers aloud so you're more confident so that you know what it sounds like to hear yourself saying those things. Um, and in addition to that, you should also write answers to those questions before you start speaking them aloud. That gives you a little bit of time to slow down and think about a response because you know, when we write, you know, we have to slow down. It's not as fast as like, you know, when we're just talking. So write down some answers first and then begin, you can put that away You've done the cognitive work of writing answers. Now try to remember them and speak to those questions based on what you thought about as you wrote answers to those questions. You can also ask family members, friends, especially like with friends like you, you know, at City Tech, y'all can take turns where you do mock interviews and practice getting asked questions and how you would respond to those questions. One thing that I found incredibly helpful with some of my former students is, especially when the pandemic started, and I can do this for you know, some of you folks if you want to do this, uh, I would do mock interviews with some of the students and I would record it so that afterwards we could either together or the student could watch their performance, which helps them gauge what they think worked well and also to identify problems with the way that they might speak during an interview. Because if you want to sound confident and capable, you want to avoid using lots of ums and ahs and other kinds of pause thinking words and sounds that we make when we might be talking normally with friends. Uh, using lots of empty words like um, is, a, is a really big one uh, that we want to try to avoid. So you want to use that video recording, the mock interviews, that practicing to be prepared to respond as confidently and on the spot as possible during the job interview. Now, you don't want to you know, think of answers and memorize them so they're rote. You want your delivery during the job interview to sound natural, like you just thought of that answer right then and there, but also to sound like very you know savvy and confident in the way that you deliver it. Uh, I think a good example of this is think of Mr. Orange's story in Reservoir Dogs. If you haven't watched that, that, that to me is one of Tarantino's greatest films. Um, and in that film, Mr. Orange is like an undercover cop, 
And in order to get his foot in the door with these gangsters that are going to like pull this, this robbery, he develops a personal anecdote, a story, that is meant to you know, give him some bona fides about his supposed criminal uh, history. Now, the thing is, he can't just memorize the story. He needs to learn the story and then pre perform the story whenever he's asked about it with his fellow criminals. This is the kind of thing we want to work towards with the way that we deliver our responses to job interview uh, questions. That we can just make it sound as natural and as personal and like we haven't practiced at all. But yet the way that it sounds to the person hearing us deliver it is going to be that we're confident, that we know what we're talking about, but they won't know that we've been secretly practicing the hell out of this you know, with our friends, with our family members, long before we get into that interview room, and they never need to know that. That's for you to do that prep work so that in the moment, you perform and really show off what you're capable of doing and what you know. Um, also, be aware that like because of the pandemic and also just the realities of the job market, with lots of candidates going in for these jobs, that there's more and more video interviews versus in-person interviews, especially in the initial stages of the, the job application process. And you might also go through multiple interviews. Um, and I, there were stories recently, um, it might have been in The Guardian, the UK newspaper, I read about it, where you know, some companies are really dragging out interviews uh, where a candidate, especially like for uh, computer science programming jobs, might have to go through like five, even ten interviews to the point where it just gets kind of silly that they keep getting called in for interviews with different stakeholders at the company. Um, and so there are times even you might need to cut your losses if it seems like you're in this kind of infinite interview situation uh, or to ask advice from uh, other people in the field about this particular company if that ever happens to you. So you can make a decision about like whether you need to be you're giving more time to that or backing off and looking elsewhere. Now, during the job search and after, you want to develop and foster your professional network. So like with LinkedIn.com, it's really great for building connections with other people in your field, through your professors, etc. But you want to make sure those connections are meaningful. It's not like having a Facebook friend. You need to have connections with people on LinkedIn.com that are meaningful, people that you know, that you talk to occasionally, and you want to follow up and talk to them occasionally, whether it be with messages, a phone call, a, 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 a video chat, whatever it might be, uh, to make sure they know what you've been up to and you can also learn what they've been doing. Um, and they might be able to tell you about opportunities and you can do likewise. But the thing is to, to keep those connections up. Uh, you need to prioritize your applications. Some are going to be like your top 10 jobs, those you really, really want at those really great companies, and others are like where it becomes a numbers game. Uh, like even for this job, whenever uh, I was applying for jobs before I landed this one at City Tech, I was sending out like 100 applications. There's 100 applications to different universities. Um, most of them in the United States, but some in Canada and some international. Um, and for most of those, I was sending out like my basic materials. I customized them a little bit for the, the specific jobs, but it was only like the real dream jobs that I really spent a lot of time on the application. Um, and City Tech was one of those. Now, through the process, don't give up. It can be an arduous process. You know, it takes time, it takes a lot of energy, but again, that is a job in and of itself to be applying for these jobs that you want to get. Now, through the job search process, um, you want to fill any gaps in your employment. So like if you get laid off, if you quit, whatever it might be, you want to fill those gaps of time with that more education and go back and take you know, a continuing education class, uh, go get a certification, you can do volunteer work, whatever it is that you can do to make it look 
not only that you're busy, but that you're gaining more skills, more experience. Because if you don't do anything, like let's say you get laid off and then you stay at home playing like, you know, uh, Call of Duty all day long. Well, there's going to be a question when you begin applying for jobs again, you know, six months later, about what were you doing during the six months you didn't have a job. You don't want to say that you were just playing Call of Duty. Um, now, I, obviously, there are situations where people do make claims about like you know, leadership skills they might have gained through uh, campaigns in different video games, like World of Warcraft, for example, like leading a guild. That's certainly fine and good. But again, you should be supplementing that, adding something to that that is more specific to the job during that time. Uh, gaining more education, taking online classes, anything that looks professional. And I'm not to say you can't use like video game experience uh, for leadership skills, etc. But that shouldn't be the only thing that you're relying on, is what I'm saying. Be a lifelong learner. Uh, because certainly you know, today is you, you're not likely going to be working in the same job for like 40 years that just isn't really heard of anymore uh, you're going to be you know, not only on your own maybe looking for other work but you might be laid off uh, there's a lot of flux and fluidity to the job market now uh, so you should be prepared for that uh, not only like specifically looking looking in your field and learning more about your field but looking at tangential fields or other other areas, totally different work that you might be interested in so that you're ready in case you need to switch careers, switch into another line of work, that you're ready for it. And again, always look for opportunities. Don't like you know, rest on your laurels. Don't um, think that just because you got the job you like that that's the end all be all. You want to be looking for other things that might enrich your life, make your life better for yourself, for your family. Uh, and, and I don't mean that just in terms of money. You might want to find a job that takes you to a, a better place to live where you can like afford a house or like have time off uh, because the job doesn't require you to work as many hours so you can spend more time with your family. So there's all these types of things that should go into the calculation. Don't just be looking at what's going to, what job's going to pay you the most or um, is going to look the most prestigious. There's a lot of other things that should figure into um, your you know, like your job finding uh, algorithm uh, beyond just like money it needs to be about the big picture and of course that can change over time too like right now maybe family isn't that big a deal but it might be 10 years from now or five years from now so just keep that in mind all right so that kind of gives us an overview of the job application process okay so this brings us to the end of today's lecture where we talk about what you need to work on between now and our next lecture on September 22nd. So first off, there's the weekly writing assignment. And you have all the time from now until September 22nd to get this done. So after researching technical writing jobs, for those of you that are in the professional technical writing major, um, you can also search for other things that are tangentially related like you know, editorial work, editors, uh, copy editors, um, page layout design, um, other things, that, other terms that you've picked up in your other classes, you can use those as the basis for what types of jobs you're looking for. Um, for those of you that aren't in the professional technical writing program in the class, look for jobs that are specifically related to your major uh, and to the field that you want to go into with the degree that you're earning from City Tech. I want you to use the, the terms related to what your career is, uh, what your career intentions are on monster.com. With monster.com uh, is a really great resource to uh, investigate these different jobs, see what's available geographically, like you're going to be able to see what jobs are available um, around a particular zip code or city that you put in. And after looking at as many of these as you can, okay, I, you know, I don't want to set like a hard and fast number, but you need to read uh, at least somewhere between 10 and 20 jobs. And I mean, really read them. Find out about the companies. Look at the, the words that they're using, the terminology, and have your notebook out so you can jot those things down. You want to write down any terms you see using over and over again, phrases that are recycled on all the job listings. Um, Anything that you can find out about patterns 
in the different types of jobs? What kind of experience are they looking for? What kind of educational background, work experience, any of that stuff? And after you've done that research, you've read a whole ton of these different um, uh, job listings, and you've put those things you've learned in your notebook, in your notes, I want you to write a memo of approximately 250 words or more describing your uh, observations. Uh, that should include what type of jobs did you see, what kind of specializations maybe were included in that. Where are the jobs located? Are you, are you finding a lot of jobs here in the city if that's where you want to live or in other places? Uh, what types of qualifications are being sought? Uh, what kind of work experience is required? Uh, anything that you can find about these jobs will be beneficial to you as you begin developing your job application portfolio for this first project in our class. Now, you know, I say you're going to write a memo. I'll give you an example of this uh, on our open lab site for this week's weekly writing assignment. Uh, but if you're not familiar with the memo format, uh, basically you start with a header at the top and you have one line for to, a line for from, a line for the date, and then a line for the subject. To would be Professor Ellis. From would be your first and last name. Uh, for the date should be September 22nd because that's when this is due. You always want to use the date when something's actually due for the date that you include on uh, the document. Then for the subject, uh, you can call this job research. And then in that 250 words that you write underneath the memo block at the top, you want to begin with one sentence that explains what this memo is about. And basically you are summarizing your job your job uh, search research on and then say what kind of job you're researching and then describe in your own words what you found out. Uh, you're going to write that memo in whatever word processing software you like, Google Docs, uh, Microsoft Word, Apple Pages, LibreOffice, doesn't matter, and then copy the whole memo and then on Open Lab you'll want to click on the title for this post that I'm on title weekly writing assignment week 2 click on that scroll to the bottom and you're going to see a comment box you paste your memo into the comment box read it over one more time make sure everything looks good and then click post and then that'll it'll just take a minute and then you'll see it post onto our open lab course site so that's the weekly writing assignment so it's going to require some research on your part and then you're going to do some writing based on what you learn. 250 words. It's like a one page um, double spaced. Okay, It's not a lot of writing and it's based on things that you're going to be learning and that's going to be beneficial for the documents you create on this first project in our class. Now there's also uh, some homework that I want you to be working on. Um, Besides the reading, you know you got to do the reading. Chapter 2 of Anderson's Technical Communication, it's all about the job application documents. Learn about those different documents so you know more about them than what I was able to describe during today's lecture. And then I want you to create another document on whatever word processor you like to use. Save this someplace safe. But you're going to create a new document that you will use as your personal job search database. This is where you list all of your educational, work experience, volunteer experience, any other relevant experiences that you've had that you might want to list someday on a resume or a job search letter. Make sure you provide a detailed list of all the skills that you have. If you talk about your computer skills, you need to say what software, what versions of the software do you know? Um, what types of computer hardware are you most familiar with? Um, how would you rate like your experience using PCs versus Macs, for example? You need to give some qualifications for all of this. Uh, list your language skills. List any awards and recognitions you might have earned. Um, and refer to the job search advice site, which I'll give you a link to on our open lab site, uh, for more tips. Uh, you can also look over the sample documents for the resumes and job application letter, the cover letter. But be prepared to use this document that you're working on for homework when we return on September 22nd because we're going to be using that to create those other documents. What you don't want to be in the situation of is come September 22nd, 
not have this document prepared and expect to be able to produce you know, a quality two resumes and a quality job application letter when you're having to spend a lot of your time wasted uh, going through and thinking about like your work and education experience. If you put everything down now in this document, it's going to be like copy and paste and clean it up. It'll be very quick, very painless, very efficient. Um, there's always a reason behind the things I ask you to do. And you'll find that like with the weekly writing assignment and this homework, it's to provide that foundation to build some scaffolding to help you succeed on this first major project. Uh, and obviously besides doing well on the project, I want you to get jobs later on. I want to help you do that. Um, so do the weekly writing assignment, do the reading, do this homework, and then when we come back on October 22nd, uh, we'll be ready to rock and roll with that first project's uh, different documents. Now, again, my email address is jellis at citytech.cuny.edu. I have office hours Wednesdays 3 to 5 p.m. The link is over on the left-hand side of our Open Lab course site. Um, there won't be lectures for the next two weeks, okay? So don't freak out. You know, I'm, I'm not gone anywhere. I'm here. It's just classes aren't scheduled on our Wednesdays. But I'm still going to hold office hours. I don't have to, but I want to make sure that I'm there for all my students. If you got questions, if you want to run something by me about the project, or you have a question about school, anything relevant to what we do together uh, in, in the class, I'm there on Wednesdays 3 to 5 in office hours. Uh, we can also meet by uh, appointment. You send me an email, let me know when you're available, and we'll figure out a time uh, that works for both of us. Um, so I'll see you maybe in office hours uh, today after you watch the lecture. But again, make sure before you do any of the work that's described uh, on the weekly writing assignment or the homework, you watch the lecture first, that you're making notes, that you're actively engaged. Don't space out while you're listening to these lectures by like doing other things while this is playing. You need to be an active listener and actively engaged in thinking about what we're doing in the class to be successful, okay? So good luck with everything. Uh, if you haven't got vaccinated, vaccinate, mask up, protect yourself, protect your family members and those you're around um, so we can get through this pandemic um, better than we have so far. Um, and you know, just good luck with everything else that you got going on this semester. And I'll talk with you all again real soon.